I am going to be talking to you about igniting the imagination of many. And I want to start with a story, uh, an inspiration for myself is my son. He's, um, he's nine years old now, and about, uh, I'd say a year and a half ago, he comes to me and he says, hey, Dad, what screen capture software? And I say, why do you want to know? And he's like, well, Stampy Cat uses it. I'm like, Stampy who? And he's like, Stampy Cat, let me show you. And so he brings me over and he shows me Stampy Cat's uh, videos on YouTube. And Stampy Cat makes these Let's Play videos. And basically, Let's Play videos are he's playing Minecraft or Roblox. Uh, that's my son's avatar there in Roblox. And uh, what my son sits down and does and starts doing with his friends is he starts telling these stories and he starts building these things in these emergent kind of playground, the sandbox of a game. And I'm struck by the fact that he has no barrier to entry. He's telling stories. And I'm standing here and it's one to many, but what does it look like we're in a, when we're in a many to many world? And how do we think about storytelling? So if I think about a lot of the advancements that we've had in terms of technology and where we sit now, a lot of the models are shaped through a rearview mirror. You know, we kind of march into the future, as Marshall McLuhan says. And at the Digital Storytelling Lab, which I'm a founding member and director of, we explore new forms and functions of storytelling. We look at story as a tool for education, for healing, look at it as a way to connect people, to mobilize, and also to entertain. Um, some of the things that we do, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about today, is this notion of taking literary work and combining it with new emergent technology. One of the pilots and programs that we run is called Sherlock Holmes and the Internet of Things. It's a massive collaboration. There's over 2,500 collaborators from 60 countries. They've self-organized 150 events over the last two years. What's interesting about the project is we took the work of Arthur Conan Doyle. When he was writing and serializing his work, he was talking about new emergent technologies at the time. He was talking about ballistics. He was talking about process like non-contaminated crime scenes, and he was talking about fingerprints, thumbprints, so forth and so on. Local law enforcement was reading the serialization of that work, and they were saying, wow, those are really good ideas. We should actually adopt them. So in a lot of ways, the fiction was actually inspiring fact. In addition to that, what we did is we said, well, what if we combine this with the Internet of Things? What if we use Arthur Conan Doyle's work as a jumping off point? And what if we use it as a way to challenge authorship and ownership of stories, but also use it as a way to examine the political and ethical issues of new emergent technology? So we went to Lincoln Center, and, and I convinced Lincoln Center to give us the plaza during the New York Film Festival. And I said, we want to create a massive connected crime scene. And they said, OK. And so what we, uh, <laughs> so what we did was we, uh, we worked. And what was fascinating about the project was people came into the environment thinking that they were going to solve a crime, thinking that we had established the crime scene, placed all the objects, all the clues were there, and they were going to be Watson and Holmes. We started thinking that way initially, but it was, we, what we came to realize is that was the wrong direction entirely. And the more that we opened it up into this amazing kind of collaborative space, the more that people were engaged in what was happening. What you're seeing in these images are, uh, it's interesting, and this audience I think would appreciate this, Lincoln Center says, you cannot use masking tape to create the crime scene, but we will give you actors. So then, we, so, so then we had actors that were kind of out on the plaza. And the stories that were shaped were shaped by the participants. So strangers that did not know each other, within an hour and a half, had gone from not only creating the crime scenes, placing all the objects, placing all the clues, and then solving it. And then the individual that we had that was all dressed in black would pantomime the actual crime and then fall back into the position that they were found in. Um, what was amazing about that and what ignited the imagination was the fact that we did not, um, we thought long and hard and we said, oh, okay, you know what's interesting? Why don't we do something where we dress them in period? But then we came to realize the thing that was most powerful was by making them shadows. Whenever they would unmask at the end of the performance, there was always an audible gasp because everybody projected onto them what they thought that person looked like. So, the other element of what we do with Sherlock Holmes and the Internet of Things is the idea of technology. I love this quote by Arthur C. Clarke, you know, any sufficient advancement in technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think that's really true because when people go through the experience, 
at Lincoln Center, they are moved through with a docent that is a rotary phone that connects them to Scotland Yard. That rotary phone connects to Watson, so it's AI enabled. It knows where it is in the plaza, it interacts with different technology that it encounters, and uh, we took uh, the viewpoint of an incompetent uh, Scotland Yard. And so when they, uh, when they call, they're, they're dealing with somebody who's incompetent, and they're always, try once they get it on track, they're able to kind of bring them back and bring them uh, to focus on the case. So they act like their superiors come by, and they said, here's the results from the crime lab that you need. So the thing that's also important to us is this idea of creating empathetic spaces uh, and simulations. Um, we did this with a project that was called My Sky is Falling. I had met a small NGO that works with kids who age out of foster care. I didn't know anything about the subject. But when I heard the stories, it sounded like it was science fiction to me. So we gathered a number of kids who had aged out, either at the age of 18 or 21, out of the foster care system. And I matched them with my graduate students. Together, they crafted this science fiction experience that mixed immersive theater with role playing, with, with new emergent technology like the Internet of Things, that when somebody would go through the experience, they would, they would hit these beats. So they would come to realize what somebody who's aging out feels emotionally. And so I worked with data scientists, and anybody that went through the experience wore a bracelet that tracked their emotions through it. And so what we ended up doing was mapping that experience. So normally in research, you'll have pre-survey, post-survey, audio, video, transcription. We had 26 different feedback loops in this experience that were based upon decisions. That's an example of the mapping and the bridging of the actual uh, branching of the experience. And then the thing that says Tim is actually tracking his experience throughout uh, the journey that he takes. As we go forward, we're working to build an empathy lab with uh, Refinery29, and we're taking that narrative of what a silicon accelerator is, which is usually intended to be kind of a capitalistic view on building a product or a service, and we're looking and we're saying, how can we create an accelerator to accelerate empathy? So we have a cohort of different projects that we're working with that are touching on this idea of shared realities in regards to filter bubbles and algorithms that have empathy, this notion of social emotional learning in early education, looking at uh, empathetic care within health, um, looking at uh, uh, performing statistics, which I'll talk about in a moment, is looking at this notion of how can youth be part of reinventing the juvenile justice system. Republic Media is kind of looking at this notion of love and radical, radical love and compassion in politics, which feels like it's needed. And then uh, the Afrofuturist Writers Room is kind of looking and saying, uh, how can teens in Harlem and in South Central craft a new reality? How can they be part of a, a narrative process, part of a storytelling process that allows them to reclaim that narrative? So um, as an example, this notion of designing with and for is really fascinating. In the case of performing statistics, you have a group of incarcerated youth who are working in conjunction with law enforcement. This has been deployed in Richmond, Virginia, where these incarcerated youth are building training programs for law enforcement. So it's been deployed, and it's tra they're training 700 law enforcement officers in Richmond, Virginia. The way that they're doing that is, in these shots here, they're rewriting records together. They're rewriting the record that led them to incarceration. And they're using narrative and speculative futures to reimagine the way that that record could have gone. What if that story was different? What if the, the uh, inciting incident was handled in a different way? Where would they end up and what would that, you know, that prison to pipeline, what does that look like and how can they change it? Um, they do interesting things where they take the performance and they use it, uh, the one thing that they've noted is it's much easier to get um, a permit for a parade than it is for a protest. So what they do is they take the artwork from the students and they take it out into the streets. They also do this really amazing thing where they, they build out, and you'll see there in the image, that's a solitary confinement cell. They, they use plexiglass and they take the words and they etch in the words of the youth. They use spoken word, they're doing interesting things with VR, and they're bringing the artwork into the world and allowing people to step into it. I think what's important when we look at the work that we do at the Digital Storytelling Lab at, at Columbia University is we look to say, how can we take story, design, and play and use it as a way to create these environments that allow people 
to go further than they thought was possible. There's a story that I love, and I don't know if it's urban folklore or not, but I love it and I wanted to leave you with it, is uh, that when Kennedy gave the challenge to send the first man to the moon, he, um, he basically said, by the end of the decade, we're going to have a man on the moon. The, the story goes that what NASA did was the first thing they did was throw a huge party. They had no idea how they were going to do this, right? They had just had somebody circumvent the globe, and this idea of being able to propel somebody up to a rock and then slingshot them back seemed impossible. So they throw this party, and they're there, they're drinking, and they're eating, and then they say, OK, well, let's imagine that the astronauts just came through that door. How did they get here? You know? Well, a van picked them up. Okay, well, where did the van pick them up? Was it a hard or soft landing? And they worked their way all the way back to the launch. So they reverse engineered it. So instead of getting caught up with like, oh, the heat shields won't work, no, but, no, but, no, we tried that. They embraced, and this audience obviously knows this, yes and, right? They embraced yes and thinking, and they used it as a way to design their way into the future. And so when we look at story, we think, is there a way that story can be used that can be something that allows us to be more connected to the world around us and at the same time allows us to be part of what that story is? So to me, this idea of igniting the imagination of many is this challenge friction point that's fascinating because you have this element of where, OK, what is it like when you give away control of something? And there's a number of principles that we've used that we've come up with over the course of the, the shaping of these projects. The first is the idea of the trace. The participant can see themselves in the story. Granting agency is this idea of individual versus group and back and forth, leaving room for people to go back and forth within the experience. A thematic frame, Sherlock Holmes is a perfect example. People understand what a mystery is and the tropes associated. And serendipity management is the value of white spaces, leaving white space in the design that you do. So figure out how you can leave white space. And I think if you leave that white space, you'll ignite the imagination of many. Thank you very much. Thank you.